His presence inspired awe. He was the spiritual leader of more than a billion people. Pope John Paul II. This Pope was really the right man at the right time. As a young man, he witnessed depression and suffering. He responded by dedicating his life to God. So what was his journey to the papacy? How did he change it? How did he survive a would-be assassin's bullets, years of illness, and still spend his life dedicated to others? He was like a professional athlete. He just gritted his teeth and kept going. You are... In this hour, the Pope, John Paul II. He was a little-known cardinal from Poland. But in 1978, with the world's Catholics reeling from an unexpected vacancy at the Vatican, he was suddenly elevated to Pope. In the two decades since, he has become one of history's most influential leaders. He has taken on courageous political roles and devoted his life to healing centuries-old rifts among the world's religions. I don't think that any other man could have done what this pope did. It is said that the personal hardships he endured as a young boy are what sculpted John Paul II into the pope he became. Pope John Paul II is born Carol Wojtyla on May 18, 1920, in a three-room apartment in the small Polish town of Barwice. Named after his father, a retired army officer and tailor, he is the apple of his mother's eye. From the beginning, she wants him to become a priest. His mother, Amelia, used to walk him in a pram through the streets of Radovica, the little town in which he was born, and say to the neighbors she encountered, my Lolek, the diminutive form of his name Charles, will be a great man someday. Carol's childhood begins as a patchwork of pleasant, easy days. He idolizes his only sibling, his brother Edmund, who was a doctor 14 years his senior. The two brothers were close. They would go to sporting events together. Uh, and young Lolak, uh, Carol Wojtyla, the future pope, would go to the hospital where his brother worked uh, and perform one-man plays for the uh, patients. But his secure early years are disrupted by a wrenching loss. His mother dies of heart and kidney failure when he is only eight years old. Days after her death, his father takes Carol to Kalwaria, a famous Polish shrine to the Virgin Mary. It is a place he will return to often, and one that helps ignite his lifelong devotion to the Madonna. At school, he is a well-liked top student, an accomplished athlete, and a talented actor with a mischievous streak. He was also apparently a uh, terrific mimic uh, and would do impersonations of his teachers that would reduce his friends to tears of laughter. Carol is a first-rate soccer goalie, and despite the intensifying presence of anti-Semitism in Poland, he is always willing to play on his Jewish friend's team. Never had any argument, never had any fight with anybody. Three years after the death of his mother, Carol suffers another blow. His brother dies while trying to save a patient stricken with scarlet fever. This is a pope who, in his early life, experienced suffering, experienced pain. Now he is left with only his father, a nurturing and pious man determined to care for his son. They play together and pray together. His father was a man of extraordinary integrity, uh, a man who taught his son that manliness and prayerfulness go together. He teaches his son the importance of tolerance in a town where 20% of the residents are Jewish. On one occasion, Carol's best buddy, Jersey Kluger, who is Jewish, is reprimanded by a woman for entering the church where Carol, an altar boy, is serving mass. Carol is outraged and responds, Doesn't she know that we are children of the same God? In the late 1930s, anti-Semitism is becoming more virulent in Poland. Carol is deeply disturbed when his many Jewish friends are targeted. Jews were in and out of his house. Jews were part of his life. They weren't those other people. They were his friends. 
After he graduates valedictorian from high school, Carroll moves to Krakow with his father to pursue his passion, Polish literature. But the following year, in 1939, after the Germans invade Poland, he and his ailing father are forced to flee on foot with just one suitcase. For 10 days, they trek 120 miles, only to discover the invading Soviet army marching towards them. They turn back and find swastikas flying over Krakow. Life for Carol in occupied Poland is harrowing. Jewish friends are taken to concentration camps, as are Polish intellectuals and priests. As one of his classmates once said to me, it was not a question of knowing whether you would be alive next month or next year or next Christmas. It was a question of not knowing whether you would be alive tomorrow morning. The Nazis order compulsory labor for all Poles, so Carol, now 20, takes a job at a limestone quarry. To get there, he walks with petroleum jelly on his skin to protect him from sub-zero temperatures. Toiling among the workers, he discovers a world he never knew, that of manual labor. It is an eye-opening experience, and one that will influence him throughout his life. He said that it had taught him the dignity of work and the dignity of workers. The Nazis are determined to annihilate Polish culture, but Carol is just as determined to protect it. He begins to lead a double life, working in the quarry by day and meeting with a clandestine religious group and a secret theater company at night. These are forbidden activities, but Carol defies the Germans and risks his life. That was a courageous thing to do. He writes plays, religious and historical, and pours his heart into his performances. One evening, while delivering a monologue, Carol refuses to buckle, despite the Nazi presence at the doorstep. While he was reciting this poem, uh, a sound truck, a Nazi sound truck, came through the streets outside with megaphones blaring the news of the latest victory of the invincible German army on the Eastern Front. Wojtyla simply continued his recitation throughout this noise, uh, as if the static of evil outside that window was not going to deflect him from speaking a word of truth. At the age of 20, Carol faces another crushing personal loss. His father dies of a heart attack. He is distraught that he was not at his bedside and able to offer comfort during his final hours. But he will transcend grief. His father's death drives Carol into a deep, mystical reflection. He said, he, I've never felt so lonely in my life. Uh, and yet, that experience, like all of the other awful experiences of those wartime years, uh, became in him not a reason for despair, but a reason to deepen the faith that is the source of his hope. Coming up, Carol Wojtyla makes a life-changing decision that will fulfill his mother's long-ago dream. It's 1942, and 22-year-old Karol Wojtyla has chosen the path to the priesthood, but in occupied Poland, it is a dangerous endeavor. The Nazis forbid religious training, so Carol must join an underground seminary. During his second year there, when a fellow seminary student doesn't show up for morning mass, Carol is painfully reminded of the brutality around him. Wojtyla ran to this boy's home, only to discover that he had been taken away during the night uh, by the Nazis and would be shot the next day. And he carries around with them the pain that you or I would have at losing real friends. Two years later, on an August day in 1944, that becomes known as Black Sunday. The Germans, fearing a Polish uprising, do a sweep of Krakow. When they search Carol's house, he hides behind a closed door and prays they won't find him. He is spared. If he had been found by the Gestapo that day, there may have never been a Pope John Paul II. Uh, there is a good likelihood that he would have been shipped off to a concentration camp and where he would have died. For the next year, Carol and several other seminary students hide at the archbishop's residence. He feels Nazi persecution firsthand. 
But in Rome, Pope Pius XII is seen by many to be unresponsive, something that Pope will later be harshly criticized for. In 1946, the year after the war ends, Carroll passes his theological exams, and at the age of 26, he is ordained a priest. He goes to Rome, where he gets a doctorate in theology. But when he returns to Poland two years later, the Soviets have moved in. And now they are trying to contain the Catholic Church. Carroll takes a position at a university parish in 1949 and becomes deeply committed to his students. He loves his interaction with them. And although it is prohibited for priests to meet with young people outside of church, he leads them on contemplative nature trips. He loved to go on hiking trips with, uh, with young people, uh, would say mass out in the, in the mountains uh, with them. What he was doing, I think, was creating zones of freedom. Uh, he was creating a small space in which, as these students, now older men and women, uh, once said to me, they could really be themselves. For the next several years, those young men and women will replace the family he lost when he was young. He gains a reputation for being a patient listener, allowing confession to go on as long as necessary. The talk is not just of religion. His students confide in him and seek advice about some surprising topics, love, marriage, and even sex. They all say that his attitude towards sexuality within the bounds of marriage is an extremely healthy and open one. Carroll becomes a professor of ethics at the Catholic University of Lublin in 1954, and four years later is given an opportunity that begins his meteoric rise. At the age of 38, he is appointed Bishop of Krakow. What the hierarchy in Poland saw was a man who was a natural leader, but at the same time was extremely intelligent, extremely well-versed in the theology of the Catholic Church, and also extremely well-versed in the history of the Polish people. In the early 1960s, he makes a name for himself at the Second Vatican Council, where bishops gather to discuss sweeping reforms of the Catholic Church. Carroll promotes the idea that religious freedom should be a basic human right. In 1963, he is appointed Archbishop of Krakow. The communists think Carroll is a safe bet, an intellectual who won't rock the boat politically. They will eventually discover how wrong they are. If the communist government in Warsaw didn't understand that this man had a great interest in world events, they made a big mistake, and that might have been the biggest mistake that they made. When he is 47, Carroll is made cardinal. He could have remained in this esteemed role, but in 1978, just 33 days into his papacy, the reigning pope, John Paul I, dies suddenly of a heart attack. The Catholic Church finds itself without a leader. Coming up, Carol Wojtyla's life takes a dramatic turn. October 16, 1978, 111 cardinals are gathered at the Vatican to tackle a momentous task, the election of a new leader of the Roman Catholic Church. Cardinal Karol Wojtyla is there, sequestered with the others to ensure that the proceedings are kept secret. St. Peter's Square is overflowing. The atmosphere in the square that night was electric. It was dark, it was moody, there were so many thousands of people standing shoulder to shoulder. Inside the Vatican, the Cardinals cannot come to an agreement. But then, an idea gains momentum, the possibility of a non-Italian Pope. Cardinal Wojtyla emerges as an attractive candidate. He is a trusted voice from Eastern Europe during the Cold War. He is youthful, charismatic, an intellectual who can speak eight languages. Finally, the restless crowd, and indeed the world, receives the long-awaited signal. White smoke streams out of a Sistine Chapel chimney, a time-honored tradition indicating that a decision has been made. We were all looking up at the central balcony in St. Peter's, waiting to see the face of this man who had been elected, waiting to see who the new pope would be. Carol Wojtyla, 
at the age of 58, is named Pope. He is the youngest Pope in 132 years, the first non-Italian in 450 years. Out comes onto the loggia, the great balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, a man that very few people in the crowd had ever heard of. Uh, indeed, when his name was announced, Karol Wojtyla, uh, people were asking each other in the crowd, is he an Asian? Is he an African? Carissimi. Immediately, he wins them over by speaking to them, not in Latin as tradition would have it, but in their native Italian. Uh, and within five minutes, those hundreds of thousands of people knew that they had a pope for them. He takes the name of John Paul II in honor of previous popes. In June of 1979, not even a year into his papacy, John Paul II makes what will become an historic trip to his native Poland. He was the one who started the, uh, the avalanche. Living under a Soviet-sponsored communist regime, many of his countrymen are starved for religious freedom. During his nine-day visit, 13 million people turn out to see him. It gave them the determination to remain loyal and faithful to their church. He is there not just as the spiritual leader of the Catholic Church, but as a former laborer who remembers the hardships he and his fellow workers experienced. The Poles are tired of being dominated by the Soviets, tired of food shortages, and are receptive to John Paul's peaceful but strident message reminding them of their human rights. It was a question of an aroused conscience in hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of people, that made this new kind of nonviolent resistance possible. While there are other factors that make the conditions ripe for change, Pope John Paul II will be pivotal in helping to bring about the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. While he is in Poland, the Holy Father makes a groundbreaking trip to the concentration camp Auschwitz. It is the first time a pope will render homage to the millions massacred during the Holocaust. But it is also a painful personal journey. A lot of the empathy he has and the great, huge, kind of tectonic concern he has for Jews generally and for getting a reconciliation for Catholics and Jews comes from a huge intellectual place, I'm sure but also from his own hurt at losing these people and making sure that the world understands that that's unacceptable. In 1979, the man Time Magazine dubs John Paul Superstar makes his first pilgrimage to the United States. God bless America. The crowds are enthralled. When he arrives at Madison Square Garden in New York, tens of thousands of teenagers are waiting for him. The atmosphere screams of rock concert, not papal visit. It was an incredible uh, scene that I think tipped the world off to the remarkable and continuing magnetism that the Pope has for young people. Despite the youthful mayhem, the Holy Father is determined to deliver his religious message. I invite you today to look to Christ. But on this same trip, it becomes clear that there is a tide of criticism growing against the Pope. Many are disturbed by what they believe are his unyielding attitudes on modern social issues. The Pope tends to be very conservative on sexual and personal issues. And I think has alienated a good number of Catholic people. On the last day of his American pilgrimage, a nun named Teresa Kane welcomes him to an appearance in Washington, D.C. But she does not limit her words to a polite greeting. When I went to the podium, it just seemed, it seemed right to say it. It seemed to fit, and uh, so I said it. The church, in its struggle to be faithful to its call for reverence and dignity for all persons, must respond by providing the possibility of women as persons being included in all ministries of our church. It is the first time anyone has publicly confronted John Paul about an issue that is creating dissent in the United States. Women are not permitted to be ordained Catholic priests. In a very simple, calm way, she told him of the pain that so many American Catholic women are facing. And again, I don't think he was all that pleased with it. 
At the time, Sister Kane doesn't directly learn what the Holy Father thinks. But five years later, when she requests a papal visit, it is denied. I think it was just not seen uh, politically uh, advantageous for such a meeting. The Pope creates another controversy in 1980 when he bans priests from holding public office, asserting that it is inappropriate for priests to align themselves with a political party. A lot of people, especially in America, especially in the United States, didn't understand why a pope who was so driven to fight communism, so driven to fight political injustice, would not allow a priest to hold office. Coming up, John Paul II puts up the biggest fight imaginable, a fight for his own life. In 1981, John Paul II is a popular pope who attracts a devoted crowd in St. Peter's Square for his regularly scheduled address. But on May 13th, there will be nothing ordinary about his public appearance. Just after John Paul blesses a little girl, a Turkish man, Mahet Ali Aja, takes aim from behind a wooden railing. He fires two shots point blank at the pope. Hundreds of pigeons dart into the sky panic erupts in the square. I think the entire world felt a profound sense of shock. Uh, here was a man who in three brief years had demonstrated on a world stage uh, his remarkable capacity to touch not only Catholic lives uh, but human lives throughout the world. Uh, and suddenly the hand of evil reached out and struck him down. The Pope is rushed to a nearby hospital, uttering faint prayers along the way. He loses consciousness when he arrives and is raced into an operating room. The people that, that were gathered outside Gemelli Hospital were visibly shaken, visibly frightened, and visibly upset by something that was unfathomable. After five hours of surgery, he is stabilized. One has to reach for the word miraculous to uh, describe his survival. Uh, he was shot at point-blank range by a professional assassin. Uh, the bullet missed every major artery in his uh, body, missed every major nerve cluster in his body. John Paul later says he believes it's his cherished Virgin Mary who saves him that day. Theories circulate as to who put Aja up to the assassination attempt, but nothing is ever proven. The Pope says, and said to his closest friend in the Vatican, uh, I don't care who's responsible for this, because whoever did it, the devil did it. The devil was conspiring, and the devil has a thousand ways of conspiring with him. But the Pope does have unfinished business concerning the assassination attempt. Two years after he is shot, John Paul goes to the prison where Aja is incarcerated. There, he celebrates mass, and in a stunning show of forgiveness, prays with the man who tried to kill him. In 1986, John Paul makes history again. He becomes the first pope to visit the synagogue of Rome. By crossing the river and going to the Jewish ghetto, John Paul did what no pope had done in more than a thousand years. There, he acknowledges the wounds endured for hundreds of years by Jews living in Christian countries and calls for the end of all discrimination and the brotherly coexistence of the two religions. But many are troubled a year later when John Paul meets with Austrian President Kurt Waldheim, a former Nazi officer who has not acknowledged or publicly expressed regret for his role during World War II. As the 1980s continue, it becomes clear how adamant the Pope is regarding church prohibition on contraception, abortion, divorce, women in the priesthood, and homosexuality. Many American Catholics think the church should be more flexible. One U.S. priest named Charles Curran, who teaches theology at Catholic University, directly challenges aspects of the church doctrine. We got over 600 uh, theologians and Catholic scholars to say 
that one could dissent and disagree with the papal teaching on artificial contraception and still be a loyal Roman Catholic. The Vatican cannot, is not pleased not that Curran is the so outspoken. The Pope bans him from teaching at any Catholic university. Now it is interesting that John Paul II, when he talks about the political society and secular society, has all sorts of marvelous things about the need for dissent. You have to have different perspectives. People have to be free to say their perspectives, etc. But he doesn't see that for the church at all. Over the next three years, as he travels the globe, Pope John Paul II is confronted by vocal protesters who think he is out of touch with modern times. But while some parts of the world take issue with his traditional views and want to restrict his influence, John Paul continues to have enormous impact on his native Poland and Eastern Europe. The great story of our time is the fall of communism and the central player who hastened the demise of the fall of communism is this Pope from Poland. John Paul serves as advisor and clandestine financial supporter to the union movement Solidarity, sending money for fax machines, photocopiers, and pirate radio stations to enhance communication. When Solidarity was, was growing and arising, when there was an opportunity for freedom in Eastern Europe, he knew exactly what to do at the right time, at the right moment. When the Berlin Wall falls in 1989, it is clear that the seeds John Paul planted on his first trip home back in 1979 took hold and eventually contribute to this historic event. Communism in Eastern Europe topples. It was not done by tanks or missiles or, or, or troops. It was done because he empowered the people of Poland when he said, be not afraid. Although often criticized for his conservative views on sex, he shows the world that he is not prudish about the human body. When the Sistine Chapel is restored, he orders draping removed from Michelangelo's masterpiece, The Last Judgment, returning the figures to their original nudity. In the context of a monogamous heterosexual couple, the Pope could apparently celebrate sexuality. Uh, this is a Pope who has thought deeply and carefully about the meaning of human sexuality, about what uh, our lives as sexual beings teaches us not only about ourselves, but about God. Coming up, John Paul II faces another wrenching personal battle. For 15 years, Pope John Paul II has traveled throughout the world, a champion of human rights. The Lord be with you. But in April 1994, he offers his own home to spread that message. American conductor Gilbert Levine, who formerly led the Krakow Philharmonic, suggests doing a concert somewhere in Rome to commemorate Holocaust survivors. John Paul offers the Vatican and then goes even one step further. He invited Holocaust survivors from around the world. He made it to, into a papal concert. He made it into, into a literally historic event. Survivors sit among cardinals. I could see that the John Paul II's eyes starting to well up. And what he said at the concert was astonishing because he looked into the camera and he said to 900 million Catholics and whoever else was listening that those six million that died were us. Vediamo la pace derisa, la fratellanza. And that's such a profoundly important thing to say, because the wound of the six million was a wound that he took on himself. It wasn't just a Jewish wound. It was a memory that should live in the minds of all humankind, and all Catholics especially, because he could speak directly to Catholics. It is a fulfilling event for Conductor Levine. He has developed a warm relationship with the Pope, and remembers his first papal concert six years earlier when he discovered a surprising side of the Holy Father. It was going to be a privilege, huge privilege for me to conduct for him. He comes over to me, puts his arm around me, and says, have you had enough rehearsal time? I said, why? He said, I heard the Pope is coming tonight. It's a very important concert, you know. Have you had enough rehearsal time? 
Really, couldn't you go back and have another one? <laughs> Despite being burdened with an enormously demanding schedule, the spiritual leader for more than a billion Catholics finds time to take personal interest in many of those around him. He jokingly promises to protect U.S. Ambassador Raymond Flynn's teenage daughters from Italian boys. He says, well, Pope has big window way up on top of the Vatican, and he looks down, he can see all over Rome, and he says he will look at night to make sure Ambassador's daughters are okay and they get home early enough. But this caring, generous man continues to make it known that on some issues, his views are ironclad. In 1994, he ratchets up his stance on the ordination of women. He actually bans the mere discussion of it within the church. Now, frankly, that's obviously ridiculous. And it flies in the face of all the other changes that we've had in the church that came from the bottom up. I think he's firm. I think he's determined. I think he's going to let you know exactly how he feels. And I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that, to be honest with you. Just as he wants to control what is discussed within the church, he often tries to control the kind of image he projects. Like the time he made sure a photo opportunity was captured with a famous friend. Just as he came to Mother Teresa, he looked at the corner of his eye and spotted her, but the photographers were in back of, of the Holy Father. And what he did was, is just to move her in, in line of a good uh, photo. Because I think he has that savvy, he has that instinct. Our Father, who art in heaven. In 1994, this very public man, who wants to portray his determination and vitality, gets some devastating news about his health. At the age of 74, John Paul is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, a neurological disorder that causes tremors. And I felt, I felt very, very sorry for him. Because he, you know, he wanted to walk, wanted to, you know, be active and, and very sorry. For him not to be able to use his body to support what his mind is trying to say has been terrible. I think initially it was something of an embarrassment to him and yet uh, the old actor came out uh, in him fairly quickly. He began twirling his cane like a vaudevillian on occasions. Uh, and he, I think he deals with his physical suffering both through his faith and through a very robust sense of humor. I once asked him, Holy Father, how are you feeling? And he shot back, neck down, not so good. Coming up, many fear John Paul's reign may be nearing an end, but he is determined to carry his papacy into the new millennium. It is 1995, and John Paul, now 75, is suffering from Parkinson's disease. He cuts an image of an infirmed elderly man, a shadow of his former self. Many begin to foresee the end of his papacy, but the Pope defies their prediction. Fierce determination. Fierce determination. I mean, think about it. Why does he need that? I mean, why does he need another trip to the United States or Africa? He really believes that this is the work of God, and God is going to call on him to do these things until God says it's time to stop. He travels to the Philippines and attracts what is said to be the largest gathering in human history. Between five and seven million people come out to see the Holy Father. God bless the Philippines. Mabukai and Filipinas. Although this leader is in his late 70s, he knows the value of modern technology. In 1997, the Vatican website boasts 2.9 million hits during its first three days of operation. Prophete. 
In March 2000, John Paul performs what many consider to be an extraordinary act. He asks forgiveness from God for sins committed in the name of the Roman Catholic Church over the past 2,000 years. During a day of pardon mass at St. Peter's Basilica, he acknowledges the church's mistakes and the cruelty it has inflicted upon Jews, women, and minorities. The Pope wanted to lead the world's Catholics in, in basically a giant global confession. Quali sono le nostre responsabilità? He wanted to go through this litany of things that he wasn't in control of. It's only been Pope since 1978, but that ached in his heart. Still, some are disturbed that he is not specific enough, failing, for instance, to mention the Holocaust by name or to single out Pope Pius XII's wartime silence. Welcome to the Holy Land. A week later, John Paul makes news again when he begins a long-anticipated trip to the Holy Land, Israel. Jordan. I join all Jordanians in welcoming you to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And the Palestinian territories. I welcome you as an esteemed guest to Palestine. It is a trip that took five years of intense diplomatic and logistical preparations. The great desire I have to celebrate the beginning of my pontificate in Bethlehem. When Pope John Paul II went to the Holy Land in March 2000, he was fulfilling a dream that he had nurtured since the beginning of his pontificate. A dream to walk where the Hebrew prophets and Jesus had walked. I, I think it was one of the greatest moments of his life. <laughs> You could see it in his eyes. It's something he wanted to do for years that no security person thought was a smart idea and that he said, I'm going anyway. And despite being the target of an assassination attempt 19 years earlier, he rebuffs suggestions that he wear a bulletproof vest. He is determined during his six-day journey to bring his message of peace to a land brimming with the tension of old battles and religious hatred. On the final day of his pilgrimage, at the age of 80, he climbs 86 steps to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, Judaism's holiest site. He stands for a silent moment and leaves a letter in a crevice containing a plea for forgiveness for Christian offenses against Jews. I think that signal of profound respect for Jewish history, that profound commitment to a different future, made a remarkable impact on people throughout the state of Israel. Although he is suffering from a debilitating neurological disease that slurs his speech and causes uncontrollable shaking, John Paul refuses to slow down. He continues to speak out, no matter how controversial the issue. In July 2001, he presses President Bush to stand firm against embryonic stem cell research on the basis that it destroys innocent human lives. Reject practices that devalue and violate human life. John Paul II has spent a lifetime fighting for religious tolerance. So, on September 11, 2001, when terrorists, motivated in part by religious zealotry, attack the United States, it cuts him to the core. The Pope has been talking about it incessantly. So I think there is a tremendous concern about it, uh, about the loss of life, but also about this issue of the, of the terrible wound to the tolerance of man, the wound to our ability to be one another's brother. Yesterday was indeed a dark day. The day after the attack, when he gives his general audience, he asks the pilgrims not to applaud. He speaks in English, and expresses his sorrow about the assaults on human dignity. All who are doing the utmost to rescue survivors and help those affected. 
Over the next several weeks, as the United States weighs its retaliation options, it is an agonizing problem for the Pope. Of course, he abhors terrorism, but he is also opposed to war. And they'll have debates in this country of, uh, you know, appropriate responses, and it'll be very popular with the American people and the world community. But it won't be popular with John Paul II. Whether or not his views are adhered to, the Pope is still a force to contend with. Even though he looks so frail and so sick, from a distance, when you're right next to him, looking in his eyes, you still feel the spark, the vitality, the energy that is inside his mind. 22 years, and they're still going to go. But even the strongest believers in his longevity must inevitably ask the question, who should succeed John Paul? Some have suggested that this time the Cardinals will elect an older man, one who will not have an opportunity to dominate the Vatican as long as John Paul II has. Others believe the next pope would be wise to closely follow John Paul's ideas, his style of connecting with more than one billion Catholics worldwide. Regardless of who becomes the next Holy Father, he will follow in the wake of a remarkable legacy. Who is ever going to be able to replace him, fill those shoes? Of course, we all know that nobody's irreplaceable, but from a point of view of our lifetime, we will never see the likes of this unique man again. I think the great human accomplishment of Pope John Paul II has been to restore in many, many millions of lives, after a century of fear, a great hope for the human future.